Sunday I won't have a meal. I did eat a sandwich though without my without my teeth in there. I broke them off on a raisin. I was eating a salad and one of these raisins. They were really over the hill. They're real hard. I broke the first one off. The second one just came off because it didn't have its neighbor there. Next, uh, next Sunday, they're trying to talk me into singing a solo. <laughs> That'll be kind of shocking because I can't sing. <laughs> but I'm not afraid. We're going to have all kind of country-ish, bluegrass-ish, old-timey songs. We were just talking about that. Bob's in, into it. I'm into it. I love that old stuff. You know what I mean? So they're trying to talk me into me to do a solo for one of those songs. But, and I might, I might do that. Or maybe not. <laughs> really? Maybe I don't hear myself the way I really am. I don't know. This is Pentecost Sunday. Did you know that? Pentecost Sunday. Pentecost is the 50th day, or the 50th week, 50th day after Easter. So uh, the apostles were all in an upper room where they, pat, where they had the Seder, the last meal with Jesus. And they didn't know what was going to happen next, but they obeyed him, and he said, wait. He said, wait, and they were waiting there. To, I mean, they could have waited for a knock on the door, and they would be taken away, like Jesus was. They didn't know what to do. They didn't have any boldness about them. But in Acts chapter 2, in the first four verses, here's what happened. That when the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly, a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. Rushing, sound of a rushing mighty wind in the King James. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire and that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Would you bow your heads with me? Dear Lord, we thank you for the opportunity to carry this message into this house today. And we pray that this message will be blessed to the spirits of every person that's here. In Jesus' name, amen. This was the first time the believers spoke in tongues. My own. First time the believers spoke in tongues. Many claim that tongues ceased at the end of the apostolic age. The end of the apostolic age means that when the last apostle, uh, John, the revelator, that when he died, that was the close of that age. So in other words, when the original apostles were all gone, some claim that that was the end of these spiritual gifts. But, and here's what, here's, Here's the verse that they, that they use in 1 Corinthians 13 and 8. It says, Love never fails, but where there are prophecies, they will cease. Where there are tongues, they will cease. They will be stilled. Where there is knowledge, it will pass away. But tongues have been manifested all down through the ages. They have not ceased yet. That scripture refers to a time when tongues will cease. Those things will cease, but they have not ceased yet. Examples among the church fathers that lived following the death of John in 98 AD, Montanus of Phrygia stands as a leader in support of tongues. Eusebius in the 4th century, uh, he was a 4th century historian. A church historian writes that the followers of Montanus would be carried away in spirit and wrought up into a certain kind of frenzy and irregular ecstasy, raving and speaking and uttering strange things. These, these um, are, are from a um, from a thing that from a thing that was written by in a Bible college in the third century. 
Pacomius was able to, after seasons of special prayer, spoke the Greek and Latin languages, which he had never learned under the power of the Spirit. St. Augustine, who lived in the 4th century, also wrote, We still do what the apostles did when they hand, laid hands on the Samaritans and called the Holy Spirit down on them by the laying of hands. It is expected that converts should speak in new tongues. That was St. Augustine in the 4th century. Tongues in the Dark Ages. The introduction of the 5th century marks the beginning of the Dark Ages. The Catholic Church at that time ruled with an iron hand and people were killed for not following the teachings of that church. The absence of writings other than those of Roman Catholic is not surprising because it was all suppressed at that time. Um, it is the author of this uh, work, the opinion that the church was in hiding concerning this time. He says, for I feel that God has always had a church. Nothing could dare be published or written concerning tongues for fear of it costing their lives. Alexander Mackey in his book, The Gift of Tongues, puts it this way. From patristic times until the power of reformation, had made itself distinctly felt the gift of tongues is an almost forgotten phenomenon. The attention which the Reformation drew to the scripture is the reason for the reappearance of the gift. Men do not usually have the gift of tongues unless they know there is a gift of tongues. The first time that tongues appeared in the Dark Ages is in the life of Saint Hildegard, who lived in the 12th century. She was a German abbess. I don't know exactly what that means. I think it's probably close to what we consider a nun these days, abbess, who lived in the 12th century. She was um, German, uh, she was raised as a Catholic, but she was not educated because she was sickly. Nevertheless, it was recorded that she was able to interpret Latin scriptures and speak uh, and interpret an entirely unknown language. Her first experience with this gift, gift is said to have come as a part of a strange and powerfully moving religious experience and following a long series of visions which she had not discussed with anyone. The Catholic Encyclopedia notes that many biographers of St. Vincent have held that he was endowed with the gift of tongues. This is perhaps the closest parallel of Acts in the second, uh, the second chapter that we find recorded in early church history. In the first half of the 16th century, we find the same report about two Catholic saints, St. Francis Xavier and St. Louis Bertrand. Both men were reported to have spoken in foreign language they did not know in the course of their missionary work. The bull by which Bert Berland, Berland was canonized for his success in missionary, in missionary asserts uh, that to facilitate the work of converting the natives, the apostle was miraculously endowed with the gift of tongues. From the, from the Reformation to the 20th century, see, tongues never stopped. It never ceased. Some people maintain that, in the, that it stopped with the end of the apostles, but it, all down through history, with the birth of the Reformation, the Catholic Church was no longer, no longer asserts iron rule uh, among the church world. The instances of tongues becomes more and more frequent, beginning with Martin Luther in a German work, Surrey's uh, History of the Christian Church. It is stated that Dr. Martin Luther was a prophet, evangelist, speaker in tongues, and interpreter in one person, endowed with all the gifts of the Holy Spirit. These things never passed away. They never passed away. Soon following Luther came the French sect known as the Jansenists. 
This group arose in the Roman Catholic Church after the Council of Trent and was subject to persecution following the issuance of, in 1705 of a bill condemning them. After the persecution began, speaking in tongues was reported among this group. In, in France, there was a group, it's not included in this dissertation here, but there was a group, um, I'm going to forget the name of that group. Hmm? Huguenots. Huguenots, the French Huguenots. And they were persecuted in France because they broke away from the church and, and, they, were, and they were tongue speakers. And they, they emigrated to Canada and then the, from Canada, they, they had um, sawmills in Canada and they came down into the United States through uh, New York and they, and they were sawyers, they were sawmill people. And uh, the, the people who founded the city of Dubois were descended from the French Huguenots. They eventually wound up in Williamsport and they were lumber barons and one of them went to Dubois, John Dubois. And they, they were descended from the Huguenots, which were tongue-speaking Christians that were persecuted in France. But I just inserted that because I knew it and it wasn't in here. Some of the French prophets emigrated to England and made converts there, with tongues being a part of the British revival also. In the same period, the Encyclopedia Britannica tells of tongues among the converts of Wesley and Whitefield. John Wesley, who, as you know, was the founder of the Methodist Church, once wrote a protest against a Dr. Middleton who wrote, after the apostolic time, there is not in all history one instance of any person who had even exercised that gift of tongues. And Wesley replied to him, sir, your memory fails you again. It has been heard more than once, no further off than the valleys of Dauphiny. So even, even uh, Wesley admitted that there were that there were tongues, even in his time. The atmosphere of the revivals that followed the Wesleyan movement was one of informality, spiritual fervor, and religious enthusiasm, crying out with groans and sobs in prayer. Shouting and uttering of unintelligible sounds were common of this early period. Another movement that displayed Pentecostal characteristics developed in England during the 17th century. They were called the Society of Friends or Quakers. Um, while waiting upon the Lord in silence, as often we did, for many hours together, we received often pouring down of the Spirit upon us, and our hearts was, were glad, and our tongues loosed, and our mouths opened, and we spoke with new tongues as the Lord gave us utterance, and as His Spirit led us. That was the Quakers, which was poured down upon us on sons and daughters, and the glory of the Father was revealed. And then we began to sing praise to the Lord God Almighty and to the Lamb forever. The Quakers were followed by the Shakers, which originally were called Shaking Quakers. And the Shakers, they were also um, had Pentecostal worship and were tongue speakers, which accompanies always the baptism in the Holy Spirit. It says, some who attended confessed their sins aloud, crying for mercy. Some went into a trance-like state in which they saw visions and received, received prophecies of Christ's imminent second coming. Others shouted and danced for joy because they believed that the day was at hand for wars to cease and God's kingdom on earth to begin. Along with other spiritual gifts, speaking in tongues was prominent among the shakers. Imagine that. Of all the groups mentioned during the Reformation, none has received as much notice as the Irvingites, a sect that was developed in, in Great Britain about 1825. See if I can skip some of this reading here. The gift of tongues was soon to follow and became a part of his services. 
a strong faction formed against Irving and his followers, and ultimately they were turned away from the Presbyterian Church. The result was the formation of the Catholic Apostolic Church, often called Irvingites, the body of leadership of, uh, because of the leadership of Edward Irving. This body wrote a tongue's tenet in its theology. So coming over to America, another religious sect, and the, 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 these are actually talking about Mormons, that there were tongue-speaking Mormons. And then if we go down here, I'm going to skip some of this reading here. As the 19th century came to a close, space limits me from enlisting all the instances of tongues that took place. In 1875, R.B. Swan writes that he and others spoke in tongues. 1879, W.J. Walthall also received the baptism in the Holy Spirit, speaking in tongues. In 1880, in, in Karakara, Armenia, a strong Pentecostal movement breaks out with speaking in tongues. That same year, tongues is reported in Switzerland and on and on this also can this also includes the revival of Topeka Kansas in the 1900s tongues never stopped Pentecostal churches of which we are one still do that still practice that because that's something that's a gift from our God Methodism which was John Wesley started in England and it came to this country, came out of a reaction to the formalism of the mainline churches, which were all about the church. People, the poor people couldn't even afford decent enough clothes to go in those churches. They were just all about being fancy and about the church itself and the awesome music. It was, they were worshiping the church itself. And it was a reaction, Methodism was a reaction against that. And John Wesley became, um, became convinced that, that you could get saved by faith. And so Methodism you know, arose among common people. Um, who just wanted to connect directly with God instead of through all that formalism. And then the holiness movement came out of the, of, of the Methodism, the holiness movement, people thought that they could seek a second work of grace which enabled them to live a holy life because the Bible says without holiness, no one will see God. And then a guy by the name of Charles Parham he was in this holiness movement, and he started a Bible school in Topeka, Kansas, and they um, were convinced that they could achieve the same things that happened in the book of Acts, that they could get the baptism in the Holy Spirit and, and the rest of the gifts in Acts. His name was Charles Parham, and he started this school. And there were some students that were having a prayer meeting, just worshiping and pouring their hearts out to God. And, this, and they were studying how this, how this could be. And a woman was in there, and her name is Agnes Oseman. And she started speaking in tongues. She got the baptism of the Holy Spirit and started speaking in tongues. And um, eventually a lot of them did that. And that was Agnes Oseman. She's the first person in the United States credited with speaking in other tongues. She may not have been the first one, but she's the first one credited in history. And then a guy by the name of William Seymour, he was a holiness preacher also. And he was interested in this baptism in the Holy Spirit. And he wanted to attend the school of Parham, and I think at this point, Koparham had another school in Texas, I think. And so he wanted, there were racist laws against black and white students attending the same school. So in order to 
uh, admit him to the class, which they wanted to do, but they were these laws. They, uh, he had to sit in the hallway outside the class. He endured that racism so he could gain that knowledge. Remember, he's a holiness preacher, and there was a denomination of black holiness people. So he got, he went to, after he took this class, he went to Los Angeles to, as an evangelist to preach, and he started preaching about the baptism of the Holy Spirit, which he did not have yet. And the church locked him out. They locked the doors and wouldn't let him in there anymore because he was preaching about the baptism in the Holy Spirit with speaking in tongues. So a friend of his, which was, he was a janitor, and he had a house on Bonnie Bray Street in Los Angeles. He said, well, come to my house. You can stay in my house. We can have Bible studies, and you can preach that in my house. And pretty soon the house got so full that there was an overflow crowd on his porch, and there were people in the, lawn, in the yard, and people started getting filled with the Holy Spirit. And there were so many people that the porch started to cave in. So they had to look for another place. And this is famous among Pentecostals, Azusa Street. How many ever heard of Azusa Street? That's where they went. They found this old, it was a warehouse. I think it had been a stable. And they moved in there. And that, they had services in that revival day and night for three years. People got the baptism of the Holy Spirit. People got saved. White people, black people, Chinese people, all kinds of races, all worshiping together. Just the way God wants us to do and to be. Amen? Amen. And God rewarded uh, their, their uh, diligence towards him with baptism in the Holy Spirit, tongues, healings. And that was the, in 1906, the Azusa Street Revival, and it lasted until 1909. And he was a one-eyed black holiness preacher. But he's, all modern Pentecostal denominations can trace the roots back to Azusa Street. Church of God in Christ, which is our big black denomination. Uh, Assembly of God, Church of God, which this church was at one time. Can all trace back to the Azusa Street revival. The baptism of the Holy Spirit was promised in John 14. And 15 to 17, it says, If you love me, keep my commands. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate to help you and be with you forever. The Spirit of truth. The world cannot accept him, because it neither sees him nor knows him. But you know him, for he lives with you and will be in you. And John 14, 25, But the advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and will remind you of everything I have said to you. The advocate is the Holy Spirit that Jesus sends to us. Acts 1, 4 and 5, on one occasion, while he was eating with them, he gave them this command, do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised, which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. The baptism in the Holy Spirit came on that day of Pentecost. It's a gift intended for all born-again Christian believers. The evidence of it is speaking in tongues. Tongues isn't an end in itself. Some people think that speaking in tongues, that's, that's our goal. Not our goal, we have to be filled with the Holy Spirit oh, to overflowing. The baptism of the Holy Spirit is the goal. And there are different kinds of tongues. Speaking in tongues is when someone gets up in a, in a service or a Bible study or a group of Christians and speaks out a message, and that needs to be interpreted. So if there's no interpreter present, the person who speaks out that message in tongues needs to, to interpret it. The message in tongues has to have an interpreter. And the Bible says there can only be three of those in one service. 
and has to be interpreted. But praying in tongues is something else. When you're worshiping God, you just pray. I was praying for Scotty, and I went into tongues a little bit. And that that's, doesn't have to be interpreted. That's not a message in tongues. That's just praying in tongues, pouring your heart out in a language that you don't know or don't control. The baptism in the Holy Spirit has a purpose. Just a few days before Peter denied, just a few days before this baptism came, he denied that he even knew Jesus. He, did, he was cowering. And immediately after the baptism in the Holy Spirit, he went out. They all did. He preached a sermon. He wasn't a preacher. He was a fisherman. His whole sermon's recorded in the Bible. The sermon was empowered, anointed by the Holy Spirit. He went out, the man who had cowered and denied that he knew Jesus, now filled with the Holy Spirit, now baptized in the Holy Spirit with the evidence of speaking in tongues, went out and preached a sermon. And the result was this, Acts chapter 2, 37 to 41. When the people heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the other apostles, Brothers, what should we do? How is it they were cut to the heart? The Holy Spirit brought conviction along with the Word. The Holy Spirit rides the Word into the heart. They were cut to the heart. Guilt came upon them. Conviction came upon them. What should we do? And Peter replied, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promise is for you and your children and for all who are far off, for all whom the Lord our God will call. And that's, what, that's us. <laughs> that's us. With many other words, he warned them and he pleaded with them, save yourselves from this corrupt generation. Those who accepted his message were baptized and about 3,000 were added to their number on that day. The church started on that day because of the baptism in the Holy Spirit, the evidence of which was speaking in other tongues. They were cut to the heart. Did Peter cut them to the heart with his eloquence? He, did, well, he wasn't an eloquent person. He was a fisherman. Not a speaker. But what did he carry? He carried the word of God, which was empowered by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit brings the conviction to the sinner. Salvation is a miracle of healing. Healing from the sickness of sin, which is the worst sickness that you can ever have because it has eternal consequences. It follows the sinner into eternity, and the result is eternal damnation. But the Holy Spirit brings the conviction. He rides the word of those who carry the gospel, or even some people who just read the gospel, that's left in hotel rooms by the, by the Gideons. They read it. The Holy Spirit follows that word into their heart. People have been diverted from a path of suicide because, of, because the Mormons left a Bible in a, in, a hotel, in a motel room. The baptism in the Holy Spirit empowers the believer to do things to say things that goes beyond our comfort zone. That's what we call Holy Spirit boldness. They go beyond our comfort zone. It might be uncomfortable to go up and talk to somebody about Jesus. But once you get that baptism in the Holy Spirit, that comfort zone, you overcome that. And you're not afraid anymore. You're not afraid. John 16, 13, but when he, the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all the truth. He will not speak on his own. He will speak only what he hears and he will tell you what is yet to come. 
in Acts 11, 15 to 17, as I began to speak, the Holy Spirit came on them as he had come on us at the beginning. Then I remembered what the Lord had said. John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. So if God gave them the same gift he gave us, who believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, who was I to think that I could stand in God's way? He was talking about that people thought this was salvation was only for the Jewish people. But in this particular time, he said to Peter, and Peter had this vision, and then he was convinced that the, that, that born again, Gentile believers could receive the baptism in the Holy Spirit with speaking in other tongues. In Acts 19, 1 to 7, while Apollos was at Corinth, Paul took the road through the interior and arrived at Ephesus. There he found some disciples. He asked them, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? They said, no, we have not even heard that there is a Holy Spirit. So Paul asked them, then what baptism did you receive? John's baptism, they replied. And Paul said, John's baptism was a baptism of repentance. He told the people to believe in the one coming after him, that is, Jesus. On hearing this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. When Paul placed his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came on them, and they spoke in tongues and prophesied. There were about 12 of them, 12 men in all. So tongues accompanies the baptism in the Holy Spirit. When you get saved, the Holy Spirit abides with you. But the baptism in the Holy Spirit is an overflowing so that it, it can affect other people. That's where the boldness comes in. It also, uh, it also helps you to resist temptations. It also helps with holiness and sanctification. It also helps you to have an understanding to penetrate when you read the Word or hear the Word uh, or hear it preached. It helps you to have a, a, a more clear understanding. Some people want to get the baptism in the Holy Spirit, but they get, they get kind of hung up over the tongues part. They don't know if they're going to hear syllables and then speak them. They don't know. <laughs> I guess they think they should practice first, but they get hung up and sometimes some people become chronic seekers. They seek and seek. But it comes during praise. It comes during worship. And it comes when you just release your vocalization and start speaking things. God doesn't, you know, we, we did a disservice to a lot of people because they said, well, my tongue started moving around. I heard these things coming out of me. It doesn't work that way. It doesn't work right, Clyde. It doesn't work that way. And it doesn't matter what it sounds like. It doesn't matter. And you start with, you just start with some, you just start speaking. You just, you just do it. The baptism in the Holy Spirit and the Spirit will flow. And the more you speak, the more language develops. But, but when somebody wants to get the baptism in the Holy Spirit, first thing you have to do is ask God to fill you. Jesus wants you to have it. He wants the believer to be empowered in that way, to carry the gospel and not be afraid. During worship, you receive it, and you speak in syllables that you don't know. You don't have to try to think what it's going to be or what it's... You're controlling it when you do that. Just give up control and start talking. Just start speaking. <laughs> well... Some people just can't do that. It's just, it just seems like it's so hard. But once you release that, it's not hard. It's not hard. You can, you, you can get the baptism of the Holy Spirit while you're driving your car. While you're driving to work. You can do it while you're hanging up laundry. You can do it while you're cooking something. And once you get it, you'll get empowered. You'll get emboldened. You'll get a clearer insight into the Word. And you'll find it 
um, that helps you with holiness, which is a battle we all have until the day we cross the shoreline of eternity. That's a battle we all have. And sanctification is a continual process in which we let go of the influence of the world on us and hang on more closely to God's influence on us. It's a, it's a gradual process. But God wants everybody to have the baptism of the Holy Spirit, all believers. And it happens when we're just worshiping and praising God. Um, I would like us to close this way. I'd like us, like us to come down around, around the front here. And I'm not putting anybody on the spot. You don't have to do anything you don't want to do. 